Let's start with the definition of our subject this evening, which is uniformitarianism. Generally, the subject of uniformitarianism goes by a little catchphrase that's easy for everyone. And that is, the present is the key to the past. There's been a consistent and uniform. That's where they get the word uniformitarianism. There's been a consistent and uniform buildup of everything that we know to exist, including man. You see, he's built up from a one-cell amoeba to a trillion-cell human being. So there's been a consistent and uniform buildup from the simple to the complex. And when you get it over in the area of human beings, from the savage to the civilized. Now, I'll give you a, a little longer definition of uniformitarianism. It is the scientific belief or theory, supposition of theirs, that all natural geologic processes have continued throughout all of the Earth's history, from beginning up until now, uninterrupted and imperceptibly. Now, that's the same as saying the present's the key to the past. There's been no interruptions in this process. It's a gradual, slow buildup. Uniform and consistent, nonetheless, but still slow and gradual buildup. It's been uninterrupted. Nothing's interrupted it. And for the most part, it's, it's been imperceptible. That is, the change has been so small and so slow, and it took so long for it to change, that we never saw the change. And that's how they get around evolution. Why don't we see something changing today? It changes so slowly that we never see anything change. It's like sitting down and you know a clock changes from 3 o'clock to 4 o'clock to 5 o'clock, but you sit there and you can watch as long as you want to. You can sit there from 3 to 4 o'clock and you'll never see the hour hand move. You can see the second hand move, but you'll never see the hour hand move because it moves imperceptibly. It moves because in an hour from now, Rather than being at 3 o'clock, it's going to be at 4 o'clock. But you never saw it move, though. Same with that stalk of corn growing out there. Now, it grows a good measure on a good sunny day that's had a lot of rain the day before just in one day. But you can sit there and watch just as long as you want to. You can sit there from the time it's put in the ground until the time it's, well, they grow, what, over 6 feet tall? And that just takes a few months to do that. And you think, I'm bound to be able to watch it grow. It grew six feet, but you'll never see it move an inch. You'll just sit there. And you'll never even know it's growing until you check where it was at one time in comparison to where it is today. Right. Now, that's the same with these geologic processes. The present's the key to the past. No, we don't know how everything happened and when everything happened over this process of time, but we know that at one time it was simple, and today it's complex. And there's been a consistent, uniform buildup from its beginning until now. And of course, they would be prophetic in saying that it's going to continue that way until whatever the end is, if there ever is going to be an end. Now, the founder of uniformitarianism is a man by the name of James Hutton, H-U-T-T-O-N. But he was rather obscure in most of his beliefs, and his beliefs were adopted by someone who's much more well-known than Hutton was, took the same beliefs of Hutton as well as some other men, and made it very famous as the practically universal theory now of uniformitarianism. And he was a British attorney by the name of Sir Charles Lyell, L-Y-E-L-L, -L -L, 1797, his years to 1875 born in Scotland, became a very prominent English attorney at a young age, 
His father was well educated, had a huge library, study in their home, well stocked with books on all types of subjects, one of those being geology. And Lyell, at a later time in his life, he started off as an attorney, admitted to the bar, I think, in 1825, but later became quite interested in the subject of geology, especially natural geology, uh, historical geology, that is. And so in 1830, he authored the major textbook, which is still around today, the three-volume work entitled Principles of Geology. Now, it's important to realize this because practically all that we know and believe about geology is based on the work of Charles Lyell and his three-volume mag magnum opus Principles of Geology. Now, he started off a lawyer, but I don't know, I guess that was not interesting enough, and he got into geology. Now you notice his years, 1797 through 1875. And if you'll remember, when we started on the flood a long time ago, we gave you some of the beliefs, and most of those beliefs were during, the important ones were during the 1800s, at least during the 19th century, not that much up until up into this century. And most of those held to some form of catastrophic geology that there had been a great catastrophe in the past. It's interesting when you go back and study Lyell's life, he happened to study under one of these men, William Buckland. You'll probably remember his name that we mentioned earlier. Buckland was the president of the Geological Society of London and a professor of geology at Oxford University. And this happens to be the very school, the very place to which Sir Charles Lyell went. And he was fascinated by many of these lectures given by Buckland. You remember that Buckland himself happened to believe in a catastrophe of the past because most men from the early church fathers up until the middle of last century did believe in some form of catastrophe. Buckland happened to be the one that invented the diluvium theory, and he became famous later on for being the one that attempted to prove Noah's flood by means of the fossil remains that he found in caves. This was Buckland that we studied earlier, around 1820, somewhere around in that general area. Now, the fellow that came after Buckland was the one that invented the now universal flood theory, that it was a local flood theory. Who was that? John Pye Smith, local flood theory. And by the time we get up to John Pye Smith, uh, the one that comes after Buckland as far as a major important figure and a change in beliefs concerning geology, Fleming came between them, but Fleming believed in a tranquil theory, didn't do anything. But John Pye Smith was the last one that we discussed. And he's the one that invented the theory that is held by most people that if there ever was such thing as Noah's flood, and of course many of the scientists don't even believe in the Bible, but if there was such thing as Noah's flood, then it was a local thing that had inundated Mesopotamian region, valley, and really didn't have any effect on everything else. But Buckland was one of them who held to a universal flood theory. The fellow before him, the Frenchman, uh, Cuvier, a few years before Buckland, also held to the same belief that the flood was universal, although they had some aberrations in their beliefs. And it's interesting that Lyell, during his lifetime, you see all these men are living during the same time. Lyell studied under Buckland, and Lyell met and was friends with uh, Georges Cuvier, the Frenchman who did so much research in this very area. So Lyell's the one that we trace this back to because, as I say, Hutton had a lot of these beliefs, but he was relatively obscure. Not that many people have heard of him today, and his theories never gained the popularity on the printed page that Lyell's did. Now, Lyell studied under another individual, William Strata Smith, who was the father of stratigraphic geology. Strata laid down uniformly, so all this fits into uniformitarianism. He later in his life met and became good friends with Charles Darwin. 
the two great Charles of the 1800s, Lyell and Darwin. Darwin's book, Origin of the Species, published in 1859, has not only a content but a style that's based directly upon Lyell's principles of geology. The very way in which he wrote was based upon his predecessor, Lyell, and what he had written already in his book, which was the beginning of a universal belief in uniformitarianism. It's interesting, though, that at the time that Lyell wrote the first edition, 1830, of his book, Principles in Geology, he did not hold to evolution, although evolution was known, of course, way back prior to the time of Christ. He believed in a direct, immediate creation by a theistic God, but he became friends with Darwin, and Darwin was profoundly influenced by Lyell, because you see uniformitarianism as far as the strata of the earth and the rocks of the earth is concerned fits right in with evolution because evolution believes we've gone from the simple to the complex, that there was prehistoric creatures roaming the earth and they have progressed now into a higher form of intelligent creatures. The same thing is true when you get over into geology, there were simple rock formations and by all the various theories that they have, now we have complex rocks for formations like our great mountain ranges all over the world that didn't exist at the beginning, but there's been a gradual buildup, and they're a literal buildup, UP, of mountain ranges. And so both of the men fit well together. But after Darwin had written his book, and Lyell obtained a copy of it, Lyell sat down, lived to be an old man, almost 80 years old, and... After he had gotten a copy of Darwin's book and sat down and studied it and read it when he first had it, he still didn't think evolution could be the answer to modern man. But as he began to study, of course, a lot of what he had said was built into Darwinianism, although Darwin wasn't talking as much about rocks as Lyell did. He was talking about birds and mammals and reptiles and fish and plants and so forth. Nevertheless, a lot of what Lyell had said had been picked up by Darwin, but just the reverse became true after Lyell studied Darwin's book long enough in his edition uh, in 1865 to his book, Principles in Geology. He finally accepted, full-fledged, although he had admitted it in his private journal prior to this time, by 1865 when he was revising Principles of Geology, then he admitted himself that evolution has to be the right answer because creation destroys uniformitarianism, as we'll show you later on. Creation, you've jumped. You've gone from nothing to something. That's a tremendous jump. Uh, that's not as much as, you know, going from a world that then was to the world that now is. You know, a flood, sure, it destroyed everything, but that's not nearly as large of a jump as from nothing to something. And he began to see that in his own belief, uniformitarianism, creation couldn't fit in because uniformitarianism says it's been a slow, gradual process. And uh, he actually has been quoted as saying he wanted to drive men out of the Mosaic record because uh, the Mosaic record was uh, so terrible in his sight because it starts off and God said, let there be, and there was. It didn't say there was a gradual process. It must have come rather quickly. And if it happened then, then perhaps it could happen, you know, over in the Gospels when we've got other types of miracles that take place in the same realm. Anyway, he ended up dead, buried, of all places, in Westminster Abbey, which is supposed to have holy people. We end up with a lot of people that aren't so holy. Well, practically everyone holds to some form of uniformitarianism. And uniformitarianism as itself is not bad as long as we keep two things under consideration. First of all, a Christian must leave room for miracles. When we have a certain event taking place where God overrules his own uniform laws that he himself has set into motion. So uniformitarianism is okay in some measure as long as we put some restrictions on it. 
And one of those restrictions is, as a Christian, we have to leave room for miracles. How uniform was the multiplying of the loaves and fishes? That wasn't really uniform because bread just takes time to become bread. Fish take time to become fish. A fish just doesn't become a fish overnight. It takes time to grow. Now you can see why they believe in uniformitarianism. Practically everything we know is based upon a uniformitarian concept. No human is born full grown. Nothing happens full grown. Everything is over a process of time. And what uniformitarianism tries to do is bring us an acceptable theory that will help explain the age, the antiquity of man, of earth, and of everything else. Because if we believe in uniformitarianism, since we know that today things happen on a very slow process, in order to get 20 years old, guess how long it takes? It takes 20 years. You can't get there in 10 years to be a 20-year-old. Everything we know takes time to get from wherever it starts off until where it is. And so one of the primary reasons that uniformitarianism is so important today is that uniformitarianism, just by definition, takes a long period of time for anything to ever get as complex, for instance, as man's brain is today. And since we know that everything works over a period and works by a process, then if we believe in uniformitarianism, it gives us millions and millions of years for these things to have transpired. But the one exception that we're giving right now is that as a Christian, we have to allow for miracles that you can get from point A to point B quicker than going by a straight line. You can just immediately be from point A to point B. The turning the water into wine. You see, uh, wine is made out of, a principal part of it is water. I mean, what do you think it's made out of? It's made out of water. But you could just set a container of water there as long as you want it never turn to wine. You get the right type of water that you've extracted from grapes and it takes a certain amount of time for fermentation to, to take place where you go from just the grape juice to the wine. But we don't find that period of time in John chapter 2. Wedding feast didn't last 40 days. It takes 40 days to go from grape juice to a fermented wine. The wedding feast didn't take 40 days, but yet he still is able to take water and, of course, the Bible says he turned it into wine. It didn't say that it gradually, by a process, was made into wine. He turned it into wine. The loaves and the fishes in Matthew 14 and Matthew 15, the same thing. What about the fish with the coin in his mouth over in Matthew 17? Now, we're not told exactly how that coin got there, but there is a possibility that it was created by his spoken word of faith out of perhaps some particle of sand that was in the fish's stomach and created it, turned it into a coin. Now, he could have swallowed the coin earlier and Jesus, by word of knowledge, knew where the fish was and knew that Peter would catch the right one at the right time, but that gets pretty far stretched because there is a certain type of fish in Sea of Galilee that goes around picking up shiny objects. But how did he get the right fish the right object, see, they had to have enough tax money to pay for Jesus and for Peter. And maybe it was only going to be a penny and, and they needed a nickel. How did he get the right coin in the fish's mouth? And Peter didn't have to stay there all day fishing until he caught that fish, you know, catch them, cut, cut them open, look inside, find any shiny objects, and look for the right amount of tax money so you can go back and not offend those that are asking, well, does your teacher pay taxes? <laughs> By the way, your teacher pays taxes. I, I just thought of that. I have to slip that in there because that's the very question they were asking in Matthew 17. They came to Peter and says, does your teacher pay his taxes? And Peter says, well, I better go ask him. I think that he does. He said yes and then went and asked him. <laughs> and Jesus shows there, Jesus shows the foolishness of paying taxes, but he said, we don't want to offend anyone, so we'll go ahead and pay our taxes. So, we got a text there for 
not going the way of most churches and being incorporated Amen. so that you have to pay your taxes, but I don't have to pay mine. That's the very question they came and asked. Does your teacher pay his taxes? Well, <laughs> we could say a lot more about that, but we'd never get through with uniformitarianism. So the first thing I said that we have to keep in mind with this limited view of uniformitarianism is that the miraculous canon does take place, and that completely rules out uniformitarianism as being the always consistent uniform process that most people believe that it is. Certainly, we'll all admit that it takes 20 years to be 20 years old. But it didn't take that long for Adam to be 20 years old. Remember back in creation, we studied the doctrine of the appearance of age. He was made as though he were 20 years old, but he was not 20 years old, or however old Adam was. He certainly wasn't just a baby, and even a baby appears to be older than he really is if you created him as a baby because it took time for him to get from whatever he got from until he got to the stage of being an infant. So we'll certainly admit that processes do take place, but they don't always have to take place. Sometimes the miraculous occurs. And then secondly, we can extend this principle back further than Genesis 8 and 22. Principle of uniformitarianism can't go any prior to Genesis 8.22, and I'll show you another text along with that. But first of all, Genesis 8.22. While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. Now all of these things, all of these things are not true of all of the time period that took place from Genesis 1.1 until Genesis 8.21. Some of those things were true, but not all of them were true during that whole process. There wasn't a day and night from the very first verse in Genesis all the way until Genesis 8:21. There wasn't cold and heat. There wasn't summer and winter that whole time. So he's saying as long as the earth remains after this time, then this uniform process, there will be a sowing and a reaping, you see. It'll be day, and day will take 12 hours, Jesus said over in John's Gospel, until it turns into night. And then night will take 12 hours until it turns into day. Uniform. But remember Joshua's miracle in Joshua chapter 10? Remember the returning of the shadow on Ahaz's sundial? You see, we have to leave room for the miraculous. Because he says that day and night will not cease. But in Joshua 10... A night did cease there. We got two days put together side by side rather than having a night intervene between the two days. So we have to leave that miraculous element as a possibility and we can't extend any belief in uniformitarianism prior to Genesis 8.22. Now if you look over in 1 Chronicles 16.30, same thing is said over here. First Chronicles 16.30 Fear before him all the earth, the world also shall be stable, that it be not moved. Well, that's uniformitarianism there, that the earth will be stable and it will not be moved like it was back in Genesis 6, 7, and 8 with the great catastrophe of Noah's flood. But it didn't say that the earth has always been stable. It just says from this time forth, the earth will always be stable. And then, of course, you've got to remember there are other passages that say that the earth will be stable in the future only up until a certain time period. And then the earth will be changed. We'll look at that text. Well, we can head over there now. Second Peter chapter 3 is what we want to deal with because, you see, ever since the Genesis 8:22 era, We've had a limited uniformitarianism taking place in the world today. A study of the ancient mounds and cities in Mesopotamia will prove this, where you've got the newer of the cities built up on top of the older ones. And you dig down so many layers and you get to a city that's 1000 B.C. And you dig down lower than that and you get to a city that's 1200 B.C. 
and you dig down lower than that and you've gotten to one that's 1500 BC. In other words, there's been a uniform, gradual buildup from the simple to the complex. It's been consistent over a period of time, but we can't take that back any earlier than Genesis 8:22 for the obvious reason that the flood intervened between Genesis 1 and Genesis 8 and verse 22. Now, 2 Peter 3 is a remarkable prophecy of, well, of many different things. And one of those things is the rise of the belief in the last days of uniformitarianism. Now, Peter might not have known it by that name, but he knew there'd be scoffers. And Jude, writing about the same thing, says that he knew there'd be mockers that would come in the last time. And they would invent a certain theory in hopes of diverting God's judgment upon this world away from themselves. And that theory, as we know it today, goes by the name uniformitarianism. Amen. Now, we're going to be looking here at the first uh, 13 verses. And in these first 13 verses, now this is New Testament passage. Remember, we're studying Genesis 1 through 11, but we have to use a New Testament passage because it speaks so well to the issue at hand. But in these 13 verses, we find four different worlds and three different non-uniformitarian events. And that's what we're going to be looking at, the four worlds and the three different non-uniformitarian events that are all summed up here in 2 Peter 3, verses 1 through 13. Peter is remarkably accurate in what he says, speaking by the Holy Spirit. He said that the prophets in old time in 1 Peter, or 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21, spoke as they were moved, born along by the Holy Spirit, and of course, Peter is believing that he's got the same unction that the prophets of old had. They predicted things that would come to pass. Uh, even people during Noah's day were predicting things that eventually came to pass. And Peter, by the Spirit, is himself predicting a certain thing that will come to pass, and it's remarkable to see that that thing is uniformitarianism. Now, if we were living in the 1500s, back during, uh, who would that be, Martin Luther's day. And we were studying Second Peter 3. Well, we'd just study it, and we wouldn't know that a couple of hundred years from our time, someone's going to invent a very theory that Second Peter 3 says was going to be invented at some time in the last days. Now, we, of course, wouldn't be living in the last days if we were in Martin Luther's day, but the point is we wouldn't have the, the benefit of being able to look around us and see the events of Scripture being unfolded and fulfilled right before our very eyes. Because practically everyone holds to some form of uniformitarianism. As I've said before, it always manifests itself in the advertisements, the cartoons, the movies, the shows, the plays, the books, the writings, the magazines where you see savage man uh, as compared to civilized man. Someone some time ago here in the church gave me an article. Um, it was one of those pictures from a magazine of a certain garden implements that they were advertising. And they had a picture of old bent over caveman with uh, a thing with a thing that looked like a hoe that was at such an angle. You know how a hoe is at an angle. And if you really want to get it down the ground, you've got to kind of bend over to get it the same angle as the hoe. And they were showing at a prior time there was a smaller degree in the angle of the whatever they want to call it, the Stone Age hoe, than there is today. And man gradually got smarter in making the degree in the hoe, the measurement, grow larger so that he doesn't have to bend over. And finally got smart enough to stand upright, and he's got a hoe made in a certain way so that now he doesn't have to bend over. You watch someone hoe, no one hoes standing straight up. The hoe is made so you have to curve your back and get over there to hook things and pull them up. Well, you see, man has been stooped over for millions of years like monkeys, and he's just now getting bright enough to make hoes 
so that he can hoe without bending over. I don't have one of those. I've got just the old savage kind where you've got to grunt and groan and bend over and hoe. But even with the new ones, you're still going to do some groaning probably. You'll still sound savage when you're out there beating that hard Minnesota soil trying to get something to grow. So you get the picture. It all ties together. Savage man with his wrong angle in his hoe grunting and groaning as he beats on the ground. So anyway, the point is just about everyone holds to some view of uniformitarianism. They're trying to sell you a hoe based on the doctrine of uniformitarianism. Or evolution, but you see it's the same thing. It's the same principle in both of those. Now, whoever wrote that article, whatever cartoonist it was, it had such a fertile imagination to dream that up. Or bad experiences in his mother's garden, whichever it took, probably doesn't even know, has never even heard of the name of Lyell. So you'll be a step on him, a step above him, step on him, I guess I should stay, stay with. If you know something about his basis for that you know he saw it on someone else's cartoon and they saw it on someone else's cartoon but you'll know how all this originated okay back to second peter three i said that we've got four worlds and three different non-uniformitarian events knowing this first that's a characteristic phrase of peter's meaning that what he's fixing to say is very Important. He says it back in 2 Peter 1.20, very same phrase. Knowing this first. So that's the clue in Petrin writings for watching what he says next. Jesus said, verily, verily. And that's when you're supposed to watch, when he said, verily, verily. And Peter says, knowing this first. That there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts. For the continu- there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts. Now that could refer to many different types of scoffers and many different types of lusts, except for the fact that he goes on in verse 4 to explain to us what type of scoffer he's talking about. These scoffers will come, Peter is even quoting the very words that they're going to say. These scoffers will come in the last days saying, Where is the promise of his coming? Now this is based upon all of the Old Testament promises of the coming of God where he would come in judgment upon the world. You've got to get that to understand why he's saying what he says. Uniformitarianism is covered here, but it's, not the primary thing that Peter's saying that will rise in the last days. He's just saying there will be people who don't believe that the promises of God concerning his coming and judgment on this world will be fulfilled. Why? He gives us a reason. Why don't they believe that the coming of God will be manifested in this earth with judgment? They said, well, since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. In other words, if the fathers prophesied in olden times of God coming in judgment, where is the promise of his coming? Which, by the way, this is off the subject, but I'm reminded of this. We pointed out in OT intro, um, whenever we were in the Minor Prophets, that a characteristic theme of the Minor Prophets was the day of the Lord. And that whenever you found that theme brought up by a minor prophet, it always brought with it a day of gloominess, a day of destruction, a day of judgment, a day of thick darkness, a day of the trumpet, a day of the alarmed against the fence cities. He says, Amos said in Amos 5, uh, it'll be as if a man fled from a bear and a lion met him. Or he went into his house and leaned his hand on the wall and the serpent bit him. And then he asked, shall not the day of the Lord be darkness and not light? Yea, even very dark. Amos chapter 5. In other words, the point is, most Christians today, if they're looking for the promise of his coming, are looking for a lot of joy and enthusiasm. Now, I've never seen anyone point this out from this text, but it's a primary text for it. If you understand which references 
they have in mind, these scoffers, when they're saying that the fathers have fallen asleep since they gave those messages that God told them to, but they've not been fulfilled. And what they're talking about there is judgment because they're saying there's been no judgment. No judgment is taking place. In other words, the scoffers here recognize that the promise of the coming of the Lord is as a destruction from the Almighty and not as the day of joy and gladness that most Christians make it out to be. If you'll turn over to the book of Jude, we've got someone who's very near the time of Noah who made one of these prophecies just to show you what these scoffers have reference to. Where is the promise of his coming? What type of coming? Well, he has a coming in judgment and indignation upon the earth. What type of coming does he have in mind? Well, Jude verse 14. This goes back in, to the time of, well, of course, before Noah, but back in the antediluvian era anyway, that Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. Oh, isn't that going to be fun, all the trumpets and so forth blowing? Read the next verse. He's going to come to execute judgment. Now, how do you like that? Didn't say he's going to come and rapture all the church and we'll all be happy together. The references in the Bible to the coming of the Lord are references to judgment of God to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are murmurers, these are complainers, they're walking after their own lusts and their mouth speaks great swelling words. So the coming, the references to the coming of the Lord in 2 Peter 3, 4 are those coming, the coming of God in judgment. And what they're saying in the second part of verse 4 is that surely the Lord is not coming, surely these promises have fallen now not to be fulfilled because since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Now, their argument here is wrong on two accounts in verse 4. In the first place, their argument is inadequate, and in the second place, their argument is inaccurate. It's inadequate because these scoffers aren't taking into consideration the fact that assuming all things have continued from creation until now, assuming that that is true, who's to say that the very moment you finish saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Who's to say that the moment you finish saying that, God's judgment won't fall? So that argument is inadequate because it doesn't deal with the future. Sure, there, let's, we're assuming now that their argument is true as far as the uniformitarian aspect. Sure, there's never been any judgment. God's judgment has never come on the world. But that's no argument against living in sin because who's to say he won't come tomorrow? Amen. You never know. So your argument is inadequate, saying, well, in other words, just to say that God never has judged sin does not mean that God will, will not judge sin in the future. You'd have to have some proof to prove not only that he's never judged it in the past, but that he will not judge it in the future. And then, of course, Peter's going to go on to refute that here in this chapter. And then secondly, I said that it's inaccurate, and this is what we want to deal with because this is where uniformitarianism comes in. In verse 4, these scoffers are saying that since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation, uninterrupted. Remember our definition of uniformitarianism we started off giving you? Uninterrupted, all things have continued as they were from the very beginning. That, in a nutshell, is uniformitarianism. You see, he doesn't name it, but he gives a perfect definition and description of it 
that since the fathers, he's talking about the early antediluvian fathers, the ones like Enoch that first began to give these prophecies of the coming of the Lord in judgment, that since these fathers fell asleep, all things have continued imperceptibly, uninterrupted, a gradual change from then until now, and we can base the present on the past because the present is the key to the past saying the very same thing that uniformitarianism by definition says, although he doesn't use such a big word to explain it. So their argument is wrong because they don't take into consideration the judgment of God that will fall on this earth in the future, which is what 2 Peter 3 goes on to deal with. And secondly, it's wrong because it doesn't take into consideration Noah's flood. That's the very subject we're on here. They're saying since the fathers fell asleep, all things have continued the same from the beginning of creation. And we've been looking now for months at the fact things change drastically from the antediluvian and the postdiluvian world system. They change drastically. And these scoffers are not recognizing the fact that there was a universal flood which so completely altered the world that then was to the point that there's no way we can tell except from what we have in scripture what the world of that day was like on the basis of what the world of our day is like you can't reason backwards there we have no idea of knowing what the world of that day was like outside of the revelation that we have in the word of god as well as the the few remains that we have the fossil remains and so forth that we have but it's the very fossil remains that are telling people that there wasn't a flood and that the earth has been here for millions of years. So we really are safe with staying with what I first said. We never will know. We never could have known what the world of that day was like outside of the record of the word of God. Amen. Because people out there have the fossils. They have the buried Siberian mammoths, but they misinterpret the facts that they find. The only way you can properly interpret the facts of history, the facts of nature, are on the basis of the Word of God. Otherwise, you've got the same facts as I've got, but I'll interpret them differently than you do. You see a fossil and you think, well, millions and billions of years. I see a fossil and I think Noah's flood. Amen. You see, we've got the same facts, but we've got a different interpretation because we have a different basis. I've got a non-uniformitarian basis. You've got a uniformitarian basis. And Peter says there will come in the last days people who hold to this very view, scoffers that don't believe God's judgment's going to come because they've never seen it come in the past. Well, he goes on to explain now in verse 5 just what I've been telling you. He says, this they are willingly, this they willingly are ignorant of. Now, the Greek is a little stronger than that. It includes men willingly being ignorant of this fact, but it also includes judicial blindness, that God has blinded their eyes so that they can't see this fact. Both things are included here in the Greek. But we'll leave it the way it is for right now. But remember that judicial blindness is also included. It's by an act of their will that they can't see it, and it's by a decree of God. But we'll leave it this way. This they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. In other words, he's saying... They don't realize, they're ignorant of this fact, that God's judgment has fallen already in the past. And it fell in a great measure in the past. It destroyed the whole world. And that is the type of what he's going to do in the last days. So all of the arguments of the scoffers fall down under this. The heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Okay, let's look first of all at the four worlds that we see in these verses. We see in verses 4 and 5 the world of creation.
Where is the promise of his coming? Since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. So he's talking about the Genesis 1, 2, 3 world. So it's the world of creation. Verse 5. This they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old. Well, what world is he talking about there? Hebrews 11:3. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. John 1, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God, the same was in the beginning with God. Verse 3, all things were made by him. We gave you Psalm 33 and verse 6. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them, by the breath of his mouth. Verse 9 says that he spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. So this is the world of creation. Verse 5, that by the word of God the heavens were of old. That's the Genesis 1, God creating things by the word of his mouth. Psalm 33 and verse 6, by the word of the Lord were the heavens made and all the host of them by the breath or by the spirit of his mouth. And the earth, really the Greek says that the earth which was made out of water also stood in the water. Well, do you remember back in Genesis, the first few verses of chapter 1? In the beginning, the earth was nothing but a watery mass. And then the earth, as far as we think of earth, the dry land was made out of the water because he starts with the watery mass and then he goes on to produce the dry land out of that. This is what Peter is saying, that the earth was made out of the water and then after it was made out of the water, then the earth, speaking of, of course, the dry land, stood in the water. Well, turn over to Psalm uh, 24, verse 2. Uh, there are a couple of Old Testament references in the book of Psalms that speak of the same thing of God founding the earth out of the waters, which is exactly what we showed you back in early creation teachings in Genesis 1, uh, verses 1 to 5. Psalm 24, verses 1 and 2. The earth is the Lord's, the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein, for he hath founded it upon the sea. Well, Peter says that the dry land is founded upon the water and it's founded out of the water. It was made out of the water and established it upon the floods. Then Psalm 136 and verse 6. To him that stretched out the earth. Now, when it's using earth in a text like this, it speaks of the dry land. To him that stretched out the earth above the waters for his mercy endureth forever. Well, remember all of the subterranean waters that were locked up. The waters came first and the dry land came after the waters. And so what Peter is saying back here in verse 5 is exactly what Moses had recorded in Genesis 1, that the earth was not only made out of the water, but afterwards it stood in the water. So verses 4 and 5 are our first world, the world of creation. Verse 6, we have the world just prior to the flood, whereby the world that then was, now he's not really talking about the earth of Genesis, of uh, 2 Peter 3, 4, and 5, it's the same earth, but remember sin has intervened between Genesis 1 and Genesis 6. Because in verse 6, he's talking about the flood, and he's saying, whereby the world that then was, the world just prior to the flood, being overflowed with water, perished. Okay, that's the second world. Then verse 7, we've got the third world. The heavens and the earth which are now. In other words, the heavens and the earth that Peter knew of in his day, and there's been no great judgment between Peter, the time Peter wrote Second Peter and today, so it's our world, the world that we have today. The heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store, so forth. And then down in verse 13, we have the fourth world of Second Peter 3. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth. 
wherein dwelleth righteousness. I use the word world in the sense of cosmos because it speaks of the heavens and the earth. So we get all of it together there in one phrase. So we have four worlds. Now I said secondly that we have three different non-uniformitarian events in these same verses. First of all, in verses 4 and 5, we have the event of creation. This is what caused the first world to come into existence. Here we see God creating the world, Psalm 33 and verse 6, by his words, Hebrews 11 and verse 3, John 1, verses 1 to 3, 2 Peter 3 and verse 5, all of Genesis chapter 1. And since we've got the event of creation, remember we're calling these non-uniformitarian events, and as I said earlier, if there's an event that doesn't follow along the line of uniformitarianism, it's creation of anything is totally opposed to uniformitarianism because things happen instantaneously rather than gradually over a process of time. So the first event that we have here is creation. Now, by the way, if you'll notice in verse 5, heavens is in the plural. Remember, we covered three different heavens that were made back in Genesis 1. So it's very... Interesting that we've got heavens when it occurs there and when it occurs in verse 7 and when it occurs in verse 13. It's in the plural. Always for important reasons that, of course, we've already looked at in the past. Now, it's also interesting that from verses 4 and 5, we again have a text against the gap theory. Why? Because remember from Genesis 1 verse 3 through Genesis 1 31 according to the gap theorists we have not creation but the recreation of the earth and that's from verse 3 through verse 31 back in verses 1 and 2 of course you got the destruction of the earth according to them in Genesis 1 however I have to read along carefully here, verses 4 and 5. They're just filled with information, these few short verses here. The scoffers are saying that since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Now, he doesn't name it recreation. He names whatever he's talking about creation here. Amen. And then he goes on in verse 5 to explain what we have in Genesis 1, the first couple of verses, along with what comes after that, verses 3 through 31. And Peter's not calling it recreation. He says from the beginning of creation. And he talks about uh, that the heavens plural are made. We've got to get back all the way to Genesis 1 to get a total plurality of heavens. We get more after that, but we've got to go back to God's heaven, the third heaven or the first heaven, depending on which way you look at it. And then in the end of verse 5, he says that the earth which was made out of the water <clears throat> was standing in the water. Well, that's the water that we've got in Genesis 1-2. And Peter's calling that the creation of the world. You see, it's very obvious here. He's not calling that the recreation of the world as though there had been a world before that. Then we'd have to end up with five worlds. All I gave you was four here. We'd have the one that was creation and then we'd have the one that we call creation, which would really be recreation. Then we'd have the one that was before the flood. Then we'd have the one that is now. Then we'd have the one that is to come. Five worlds. Amen. All we've got right here in this passage, though, is four. Right. So if you look back in verse four and you've got the word creation and you look down in verse five, you'll see that he's talking about the early verses in Genesis one and he is calling it the creation of the earth. Now, I want to show you how people are willingly ignorant of this fact. I have a certain mail out from a certain ministry where he deals with the subject of the world that was. And it's a rather lengthy article. The same individual uh, that you listened to a tape by, we required you to listen to one of his deceptive tapes to show you what charismatics are believing. He starts off here that during the creation science trial not long ago, he was listening to some of the things 
the Arkansas, Louisiana creation trials. He was listening to some things on television about creation. He said, I decided it was time that somebody taught what the Bible really said about creation. <laughs> and he means himself. It was time that he got us all straight about creation and correct Moses' account of creation. Uh, we've heard some things simply assume other things to be true that the Bible did not tell us at all. Did Noah's flood destroy the world is his question. No, the trees weren't even destroyed in Noah's flood. You know, the olive leaf. How'd you get that freshly plucked, the Hebrew says, olive leaf off a tree that had been covered by water for 371 days? God didn't create trees after Noah's flood. They were still alive. The water didn't stay over them long enough to destroy them. And then he goes on and on. It's the gap theory here. He says, I wouldn't speculate about the age of the earth, but I'm sure science is right from its judgments. On the basis of rocks and fossils, he's accepting their perverted, lost, unregenerate interpretation of the fact rather than going to the Bible for the interpretation. He even has a little cartoon along with it. <laughs> Got a picture of, uh, well, I'll show it to you so you can see. Got a picture of an earth personified sitting in the middle. Then he's got a scientist on one hand, uh, looks like a Roman Catholic priest with his collar and cross on the other. And they're debating with the earth. And in the background, there's a sign hanging on the wall says scientific belief the earth is I think he's got around 8 billion years old and then the Christian belief is 6,000 from Archbishop Usher that we'll cover at the end of this class about Archbishop Usher and the age of the earth and then he's got a quote from the earth who says actually I'm quite old but I had a facelift about 6,000 years ago what's he talking about there recreation of the earth about 6,000 years ago but this is the same one who draws pictures and advertises them, I think, you know, blow brush paintings here, of God the Father, which is blasphemy, Amen. in creation on the very front of his mail out. There's God the Father. If you ever wanted to know what God looked like, I thought the Bible said no man has ever seen God. Amen. Well, someone's seen him. Oh, he's got a long white beard, flowing white hair. He wears a robe that is green red and yellow someone's seen god here or seen a demon yeah. bible says no man's ever seen god That's right. and they're advertising this how much does it cost i'm sure others are on the same mailing list someone is you're right 25 dollars for a blasphemous picture of god and it's the same mail out by the way just released a new faith tale for children Little Red Riding Hood. So we just put that in there. I'm not going to trust someone's judgment of Scripture when he advertises blasphemous pictures of God in Little Red Riding Hood. I'd say stay with your cartoons and stay with your drawings, but stay out of calling yourself someone who knows something about the Word of God. Amen. Selling Little Red Riding Hood, a little faith tale, faith adventure of how you can overcome the big bad wolf by faith, I suppose. I don't have one, so I don't know what it's about. Anyway, that shows how some people today are willingly ignorant of and judicially they've been blinded from the truth. He doesn't know anything about Noah's flood. All the references to Noah's flood, he says they're not talking about Noah's flood, but talking about the Lucifer flood of Genesis 1-2. <laughs> well, a second event is the flood. How do we know it's Noah's flood? Doesn't call it Noah's flood now it just says in verse 6 that the world that then was being overflowed with water perish how do we know it's Noah's flood three reasons first of all from the clear references in Genesis 6 7 8 and 9 you've got four chapters dealing with Noah's flood nothing dealing with Lucifer's flood so if he's talking about some major flood he can only be talking about the one the Old Testament talks about since he's talking about the promises that were given by the antediluvian fathers of the Lord coming in judgment. Peter in his first epistle has already talked about a flood and it was Noah's flood there. First Peter 3.20 
And thirdly, because again, our same author, but now in his second epistle, 2 Peter 2 and verse 5, is talking about a flood again, and it's Noah's flood. So what do we have here? We've got the shot in the arm of uniformitarianism with Noah's flood. Not Lucifer's, but Noah's. And then a third event, which is non-uniformitarian in nature, is uh, verse 10, and that's fire. This earth will be changed by fire. So all three events, creation, the flood, and fire, are non-uniformitarian. Let's close with some implications of our passage in 2 Peter 3. First of all, Noah's flood must have been universal or it would be unfair to compare the end time judgment of God with it since we know it's going to be universal. Secondly, the flood had to have destroyed all ungodly men, which is just another way of saying it's worldwide over the globe. Or again, it would be an unfair comparison for end time judgment. Thirdly, this is interesting, there must have been a pre-flood water vapor canopy. As we taught, so that the heavens as well as the earth in some measure were destroyed, or this too would be an unfair comparison. In verse 5, notice that the heavens along with the earth are created. We get to verse 7, notice that it says, the heavens and the earth which are now are reserved and verse 13 says we're looking for a new heavens and a new earth in other words the earth was not the only thing that was altered by noah's flood the heavens the atmosphere was also altered or you got unfair comparison by talking about the heavens at creation the heavens now and the heavens that shall be if the earth was all that was destroyed then he'd say the earth was destroyed, but now we live on a different earth and there will be a new earth in the future. But he always adds heavens to it. So it must mean that the, what we've taught you before on the water vapor canopy belief from Genesis 1 and from Genesis 7 would have to be true in order to get the heavens in with the judgment. Because there the atmosphere was actually disturbed distorted if you will and so it would fit the comparison well down in verse 18 we'll close with what peter closes with in his epistle grow in grace and in the knowledge of our lord and savior jesus christ Amen. and to know his word is to know him and that's why we spend so much time knowing his word because Peter says you better not grow in the beliefs of scoffers but grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For a complete